cathode ray tube was invented in the middle of the 19th century. Of course, it eventually became the modern television tube. But before that misfortune, it actually served a useful purpose that I'd like to tell you about. Here is a particularly simple cathode ray tube. It consists of an evacuated glass tube with two electrodes inside. I'm going to apply 20,000 volts across those two electrodes, but first I have to turn out the lights so you can see what happens. Okay. Now you see what happens is that it glows inside, and also this Maltese cross casts a shadow on the end. The Maltese cross is the positive electrode. I'd like you to notice something else about it too. I can easily move around the shadow just by bringing up a simple bar magnet like that. Okay? Right from the beginning, people suspected that that glow was actually a beam of charged particles because it was so easily deflected with an ordinary magnet. But to prove that that was true, you would have to deflect it also with an electric field. And for some strange reason, that didn't work. Then along came a British physicist named J.J. Thompson. Thompson was a brilliant experimental physicist, but strangely enough, he was very clumsy. In fact, the legend is he broke every cathode ray tube he ever touched. <laughs> this is a replica of one of Thompson's tubes, and like one of his own, it's also broken. <laughs> Thompson realized that the reason the electric field didn't work was because the vacuum in the tube wasn't good enough. And he also figured out that the reason the vacuum wasn't good was because of gas that was stuck on the walls of the tube when the glass blower sealed it off. And he figured he could solve that problem by heating the tube as it was being sealed off. And so he had the tubes placed in an oven to be heated while the glass blower was sealing it. And that trick worked. After he did that, the electric field deflected the beam. And so Thompson was able to show that the beam was made of electrically charged particles. And he quickly showed that the same charged particles came from every kind of matter. What Thompson had done was the first splitting of the atom. He had shown that the ultimate indivisible particle of matter really had internal parts after all. The honor of naming the new particle should have gone to its discoverer, J.J. Thompson. And he wanted to call it the corpuscle. But that name didn't stick because it really had already been named. It was called the electron. And so J.J. Thompson split the atom and discovered the electron by baking his tubes. <laughs> this name, the electron, started a tradition in physics of naming things with individual units with names that end in ONS. So that, for example, the individual unit of light is called a photon, the unit of sound is called a phonon, the unit of matter is a proton, and we have neutrons, and so on. In fact, recently sociologists have discovered that even human populations have individual units called persons. Once the atom had been split and the electron had been discovered, the crucial job that remained was to measure the electric charge of the electron. And that job was done in one of the classic experiments in all of physics by the great American experimentalist, Robert Andrews Millikan. new lines. But to understand the nature of the atom in a deeper sense, 
would require someone to make a discovery along different lines. And that someone was Professor J.J. Thompson, a disciple of Maxwell in the theory of electromagnetism, and in his own right, a man determined to look into the internal nature of the atom and to discover how it worked. Others would later turn the cathode ray tube into TV and computer screens. But more significant in the long run, Thompson's experiments showed that the rays emanating from a heated cathode in an evacuated glass tube were electrically charged particles. Most important, those rays could be deflected by electric and magnetic fields. And no matter what matter was in the tube, they were always the same charged particles. Thompson saw that all atoms contained the same working parts, or in his words, corpuscles, which would become known as electrons. All right, so it's time to draw a diagram. So this is sort of a, a classic picture of a cathode of a tube. And uh, what I'd like to do is to be able to show you what's going to happen with that electron when it's placed in both a magnetic field and an electric field. Let's take a look. So what I have here is an evacuated tube. And in one end, we have our cathode. Now, a cathode is simply a hot wire. The, electro the electrons, excuse me, jump off of that cathode, and we, they, they are instantly in a region of an accelerating voltage. Now, that accelerating voltage turns electric potential energy into kinetic energy, and now we've got electrons that are moving. How do we get that accelerating voltage? Well, between those two plates, we put in a high potential difference. In the experiments we're going to do in class, it's going to be up around, I think, one of our setups is 300 volts. Another setup is going to be 1,800 volts. So that's where the energy, the kinetic energy of the electron comes. Now, in the absence of any other forces, once it has traveled through that accelerating voltage, the electron would follow a straight path. But what happens if we place that entire tube within a magnetic field? Yeah, it's going to experience a force. So we're going to use our right hand. Oh, wait a minute. The right hand rule is for positive charges. So in this case, because we're talking about the electron, you got to, yeah, you got to use your left hand. Okay. So I'm going to place this entire setup in a magnetic field. I'm going to draw that magnetic field in red. And I'm going to choose to make it into the plane of the paper. So can you draw in that magnetic field, B, into the plane of the paper? Good. Now, to see how much it deflects, or in which direction at this point, I'm going to utilize my hand, thumb, thumb in the direction that it's traveling. So let's see, it's going to go that way. Fingers into the plane of the paper, thumb in the direction that it's traveling. So see, this is what's tricky. I just realized at this instant, the camera's flipped. What you guys don't know is that every time I move my hands on video, I actually have to do it opposite my screen so that I'm pointing in the right direction for you. However, when it comes to the world of the right hand and left hand rules, it all falls apart. So, thumb in the direction of the moving charge, fingers into the plane of the paper, and your palm is going to apply a force down on that charge. So the actual path would be, and I'm gonna maybe make this path in red, something like that, where the force will in every, at every point be perpendicular. So I'm gonna go ahead and label that. The electrons deflected at you. Up above, I'm gonna say, the path of the electrons we don't feel as. And what about instead 
of a magnetic field, we actually place this whole setup within a large electric field. I'm going to take a moment, pause this, and uh, redraw my diagram. Okay, I'm back. So, what I'd like you to do, could you draw another version of this cathode ray tube if you need to? Push pause. It's all right. I can wait for you. But we've got a cathode ray tube with an accelerating voltage, but this time, I'd like to take a look at what the effect of placing it into a large electric field would be. And in order to produce that large electric field, I'm going to need to take two charged plates and place this entire setup within these charged plates. Now I'm going to let the top plate be positively charged and the bottom plate be negatively charged. So with the top plate positively charged and the bottom plate negatively charged, I can go ahead and draw in my electric field lines, which are going to point from the positive to the negative plate. Now, what we are talking about here are electrons, so you know that they experience a force opposite the direction of the field. So what would instead happen is that as these electrons enter this field, they would actually experience a deflection or a force upwards. Now, in this case, the force continues to be down. So, or excuse me, the force continues to be up. So what's going to end up happening is that instead of it traveling in a circular path, this is actually going to be a parabolic path. And maybe the diagrams that I've drawn don't really show that well enough. But I'm going to go ahead and write in here the path of the electron deflected by the electric field. I'm going to go ahead and write in the word parabolic as well. It's a lot going on here. If I was to figure out what that force would be, I could plug it into QE, but we're not even at the point yet where we're talking about what the charge of the electron is. I'm going to go ahead and just draw in, if you guys don't mind, that the force on that charge will continue to be the same magnitude and always in the same direction. F E. I bring that up only so that I can contrast it with the magnetic field where that force is going to be perpendicular to the direction of motion at each point and thus will actually change direction. Whoops. Still the same magnitude, but changes direction as it travels in a perfect uniform circle. Okay? Now, I don't know if my picture does that justice, but I said the words. Hopefully, you see it. Okay? Kind of fell apart there at the end, didn't it? What's the point? The point is, electrons that come off of a cathode can actually be deflected by both a magnetic and an electric field. Boom! Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thanks, JJ. Nice work. We'll talk about the math in a bit.